Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. I'm Victor. And I'm Camila. Oh. And you brought a turkey? She sure did. Even though I told her that you were making the turkey and all she needed to bring was stuffing. The stuffing's inside it, and now we have two turkeys, just in case. No, no, no. How's no, the bed? I don't want to talk. This is weird. I don't want to What's so weird about, about it? it? I don't know. Get I along. mean, you people text each other pictures of yourselves oh. naked. What's so weird if I ask you, how's it going I, in bed? You're my mom, and I don't text anybody pictures. Bed is the most important thing you have got going. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest today is a veteran television, film, and theater actress. Now, you just saw some of her work in the hit TV series, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Now, on international Spanish television stage, she's well known for her role as the Hellenius Martyr on Angelica Mivida, Tele Mundo. Okay? So let's welcome Mertella de Mons. Did I say it right, de Mons? Namaste. Namaste. Greetings, Mertella. Greetings and welcome to the Actors' Choice. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Nice name your mother gave you. Nice name. So complicated. You know, my brother and sister are Nancy and Frankie. I just just want to say, I don't know what came over them. No, actually, I do. Uh, in our culture, you are named after your paternal grandparents. The first child is named after the paternal grandparents. So I happen to be a girl. My grandma's name was Bertilla, although we called her Nana. And my grandfather's name was Bernard. So there you have it, Bertilla. Okay. Tony, is there any way you can lift the volume up just a little bit? Just a wee bit. The volume? Yeah, the volume. Yeah, it, it's pretty much up all the way. Uh, uh, let me okay. see. Uh, can't, okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got it pretty much as high. Okay. So internal. Internal speakers, is that what I should do? Okay. Is that better? On. Yeah, that's is much better. better. We can move on. We can move. Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, good. you've got quite a resume. I mean, at least 70 IMDb television and film critics. As they say in the business, not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. A lot of work there. Uh, first of all, would you please tell us where you were born? Well, I was born on the island of Cuba. Cuba. Province of Havana in a little in a city called Villano, uh, a long time ago in a land far, far away. <laughs> I came here a long time ago. I mean, you know, uh, there was a revolution in uh, that country. My mommy's Puerto Rican American, and my dad was Cuban. Uh, so uh, my mother got us out. Really, she did, and I was a little child because <laughs> that revolution is old <laughs> so uh, and then you know we I moved to New York um, with my mom and my brother and sister and my grandma and um, I lived in Brooklyn and then in Long Island and then we uh, we did what a lot of Cuban families do we moved to Florida and uh, as I call it today Flora Bull um, you know we had a democratic governor when I was growing up gotcha FYI, Kevin Graham, I remember that. Um, okay. And uh, so we moved there, and then, you know, as soon as I could get out, I did. I told my mom, I said, you know what, I'm leaving here as soon as I possibly can. <laughs> and I went back to New York to study acting. I was really lucky, went to some really great schools, Circle in the Square, studied with Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler. Just a, a, a really great time. Yes. New York, and a lot of theater, worked with Joseph who I love, 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 love so much. I, I owe that man a lot. Good man. And, Got you. Yeah. So there you go. Got you. Speaking of Cuban, you live in the Los Angeles area. There is a restaurant. I'm sure you know it. Versailles. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Versailles. There's one close by, and there, there are a couple around town. Yes. Uh, I like the one on Venice Boulevard. That's, that's the best one. Um, 
But you know, the best Cuban restaurant is right here in my kitchen. I step in it when I'm cooking. I'm just saying, okay? Yes. Uh, Cause that's a, a, the point of pride for me. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, with, uh, with Puerto Rican and Cubans, you know, we don't want to hit the restaurant. We want to hit grandma's kitchen or, or mommy's kitchen. I mean, that's the best place. Uh, but Versailles is delightful and there's Porto's uh, also, which has a lot of really wonderful yes. foods and bakery. You know, it's the busiest restaurant in the country, that Cuban restaurant. Okay. I mean, there are lines around the block in Glendale. It's crazy. Got you. Yeah. What's it about acting that made you want to get into it? You know, I have no idea because I've been wanting to act and dance since I'm like five. I, 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 I mean, that's been, it was just like I was born like that. Uh, but I think the, the biggest thing was that I really love to not be seen, me personally, right? Mm -hmm. I am not the big red carpet girl. And I don't even understand it because I think we become actors so that, so that, you know, ourselves, we can actually show ourselves, but through other means, other characters, the writing uh, and stuff like that. So I think what I wanted to do was hide, <laughs> really. Um, you know, I, I used to get so nervous in front of audiences that I would have to, uh, well, I hate to use such a, well, I th used to throw up before, because okay. I got so nervous in, in front of people. Uh, and I remember the first time I was on a, a television show and they said, well, what's it feel like? You know, a million people are going to watch it tonight. And I was like, oh, my Lord, I ran to the bathroom. So I'm better now. I'm over it. Uh, but I just love the idea of, of people and the idea of being able to, to uh, show something to other people that they can feel for themselves, you know, that they can identify with. I love the idea of bringing that to other human beings so we can see ourselves, you know, and I love the idea of being an actor because we're so lucky, you know, I, I, I get to see who people are. I spend my life listening, watching, observing them, and I get to be free of judgment, free of judgment, because one day I'm going to play you. So I don't want to, I don't want to judge. I want to watch. I want to see what is your humanity. So I That's think yeah, it's lovely. Now, you're a veteran TV film actress, and yeah. according to IMDb, you started in 1988 with a drama TV series called Angelica Mi Vida. Mi Vida, my life. Angelica oh. Mi Vida. And I'll tell you why. You know what? I couldn't get a job on American TV for nothing. I mean, <laughs> seriously. It was just so... Uh, you know, it was different back in the day. I mean, now you see Latinas, you know, you got Ana de Armas playing Marilyn Monroe. You got Zoe Zaldana in Blockbusters. You know, you got Gina Torres. You got you got Latinas all over the place right now. As far as I'm concerned, I think things have improved. But back in the day, I remember, this was the line. This was the line. After I do an audition, they go, wow, that was great. Oh, oh, are you Hispanic? And I was like, okay, I mean, really, really? Is that what you're going to say to me right now? So it was very hard. So I just uh, said, you know what? I got to go back to my people. My people are going to help me learn this craft on camera, mm -hmm. you know, because I was already doing theater in New York. So, yes. yeah, and they did. They gave me a break and I learned camera and I had a blast. I lived in Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico is the island of enchantment. Mm -hmm. And it is a long party <laughs> i used to say oh look look the party starts on tuesday because on monday the traffic in the city would be really bad but then yeah. uh, on tuesday the traffic at night would be really bad i go oh the party has begun now we go through saturday <laughs> sunday we all go to church monday we go to work and then we party okay i love puerto rico i love it and Not i you. love them and i hope that they are getting everything they need right Not now you. they have been hit hard and um I'm just praying that they're all going to be all right to get their electricity back. Okay. And then, now, of course, well, you did 140 episodes there too. I did. I did. Yes. And, and you know, and and you know, Lin Manuel Miranda, who's I play his mother on Brooklyn Nine Nine. He's out there now helping. Yes. Uh, our people. Um, but yeah, um, 
Yeah, so that was that was great. That was a long time ago. I was a young, young, lovely kid. <laughs> Got you. Yeah. Fast forward to 2012, 2013, you did a show called Grim. I did. I had so much fun. I got to play this bruja, this woman with sight and vision, and she could see and warn them, and they would come to her for information. Uh, yes, I played on Grimm. I spoke like that. Okay, so, there's a picture of you right there when you're doing your thing. Oh, that was great. Yeah, I was warning them. You know, yes. Seriously, at the beginning, I was like, no, things are not good here. <laughs> I love that show, by the way. I loved it. Was really fabulous. Okay, uh, I understand that you had a chance to work with an American theatrical producer and director named Joseph Papp. Did amen. I did. I love that man. He gave me such an opportunity. Him and Estelle Parsons, who some might remember from Body and Clyde, she's an Oscar award-winning actress. She, a Tony and Emmy award-winning actress. Uh, fantastic fabulous human being. So she hired me on Broadway. We were in uh, a multicultural company uh, and uh, I got to play Juliet in Romeo uh -huh. and Juliet, um, which is a very famous Shakespearean play. I mean, some people might know. <laughs> and so that was a, an extremely extraordinary experience and I think gave me an opportunity to get a foot in the door out here. People started to pay attention. Got you. What is the one thing you remember the most about working with an actress, singer, stage director, Estelle Parsons. Oh, about working with Estelle. Well, let me tell you, I just I just saw her this summer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Estelle, <laughs> Estelle, she required excellence, and so I I learned a lot about about what I didn't have to do and what I did have to do to deliver <laughs> a performance. Okay, and. Uh, she woke me up to a lot. Um, and also, you know what? Estelle allowed me to let go of any kind of significance, you know, that I had about, oh, doing something. And, you know, she she made it so that, hey, this is regular. You can get out there. Just do this. Just do it. You can do it. And I saw her this summer. You know, she's in her 90s now. And uh, my husband's parents live... Uh, a mile away from her house in New Hampshire on a lake. She 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 used to summer in this in, in New Hampshire when she was a child on lake uh, on this large lake in Wolfboro. I can never say the name Lake Minnewaukee. I can't ever say it right. And uh, so I got to see her this summer. I love her. I owe her. And uh, yeah, she taught me to do the work and do it right. Got you. Yeah. Got you. We got just a few more moments. Just want to let our audience know that. Can you please tell us a little bit about ABC's new program? Not new; it's a program called Home Economics. Yes, yes, yes. And Home you're on it this Wednesday, people. Do not miss me. Uh, it's a wonderful surprise character on Home Economics. Uh huh. ABC uh, in the evening, and I got to work with wonderful people. Topher Grace, as you know from the '70s show. Carla Zuza, who was on How to Get Away with Murder. Uh, I, I can't tell you the character yet. They're going to send me a bunch of PR stuff today. But I'm telling you, this is a wonderful, wonderful family sitcom that I think everybody can identify with. They really cover the bases here. And uh, it's a delightful group of people. I had a blast. Please watch this Wednesday night on ABC Home Economics. <laughs> I'm in it. Woohoo. I will tell you somebody else, Teach Marin is also in it. I think I can tell people that. And we have something to do with each other. So it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank What's you. What's a typical day like for you? Oh, Lord, you know what? I'm just a plain old mountain nice. boy most of the time. <laughs> I mean, it's not plain because I'm very busy and I have a lot of, a lot of little, I mean, I love to sew. Uh, I have a, I have my gardens. I have a garden out back. I have one up front. I, I, I am into gardening and I love to cook. Yes. So that's pretty much a day for me. And then there's laundry and then there's cleaning. You know, I'm regular. I'm very regular. Grocery shopping, errands. Um, you know, for a long time, I did a lot of volunteer work. I was a, a, on the board of directors of the Screen Actors Guild. I was the chair of the EEOC, national chair. I did a lot of volunteer work for years. I retired from that. And now I volunteer in my own kitchen. <laughs> So yeah, it's a kind of a regular day for me. This is something that happens in my life too. Got you. 
Uh, the other night I was at the Ola Mexico Festival, which was celebrating uh, some horror movies and it was a Toyota backed event. It was a lot of fun. Got to see my director friend do her thing. Got to walk the red carpet a little. Once in a while I do that stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, so yes. Yeah. You know. Gotcha. And he has a daughter. So we have things. We have family. I really want to thank you very, very much for being here today with us. Please continue doing all the good work that you've done. Wow. Best wishes to you. And please come back again. And by the way, give my thanks to Jasmine Espada. I will. I love my publicist, Jasmine Espada. She's the bomb. And Camille Cortez. Thank yes, you so much, Ron. It has been truly a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the talent Moss. This is the Access Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. We would like to let you know that we're asking our Actors Choice Squad to help us get former baseball player Kurt Flood into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt, who passed away January 20th, 1997, was the husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress Judy Pace. So all you got to do is call us come at 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. Ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball play. Okay, thank you. Roller Tony. Lancaster, Pennsylvania is a performer and entertainer that deserves more appreciation, not only for the work that he shows on and off stage, but also because I consider him being a wonderful person to share about to more people. To get to know Barry better, he was a student at the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to further his passions to act. Before and after his attendance at the university, he was cast into various theater productions on and off Broadway, including but not limited to Bye Bye Birdie, Oliver, A Teaspoon Every Four Hours, Baby It's You, Twelve Angry Men, among many others. Did I mention that for a short while he was even the genie at the California Venture production of Aladdin? Because that's kind of cool. And I Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today has been in this uh, as a professional theater for over 50 years. Let me close my eyes and say that. 50 years. That's a long, long time. With many Broadway film and TV credits to his name. Now, he's most remembered for his portrayal of duty as the film version of Grease. And as Professor Kinkapoot in Bedtime with Barney Imagination Island. He's smiling now. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome actor, director, teacher, Barry Pearl. Barry, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Actors Choice. It is my heart to be here. I'm a mush bucket, first of all, and looking at that that panoply that you just put together, you know, which brings into focus all this stuff that I've done all these years just brought tears to my eyes. Wow. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something funny. So, folks, before we do these Zoom things, uh, this fine hosts the host calls calls you and you know we go back and forth and we get to know each other a little bit <laughs> and i'm thinking you're jewish because <laughs> hey. last name. if sammy can do it why can't if i if sammy and may Britt can help him yeah. to do it then why can't you <laughs> yeah, it's a religion that's all it is religion yeah. what a great way to start the day ronald mm -hmm. <laughs> oh thank you for having me <laughs> oh my pleasure my pleasure sir by the way where were you born uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. There it is. It's a nice old picture. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. Well, <laughs> and uh, there, there was a large Jewish community there, by the way. People say, oh, well, are you Amish? Well, I'm an Ish, but I'm not, a, I'm not an Am-ish. Uh, and my, my uh, um, aunt and uncle bought a 48-acre farm uh, in 1955, right outside of Lancaster in New Providence, <laughs> Pennsylvania, where my uh, my cousin Roxanne still lives with her husband Ron on that farm, and that particular farm was uh, tantamount to me going to camp, summer camp, every summer. You know, 14 miles away, I spend and winters there too. But that was my own personal summer camp. You know, down down at the farm, and I still go down there when I I go back to visit. But yeah, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, or Lancaster, as some would would call it. Oh, right. Not our, not our Lancastrians. <laughs> Every time you see, talk to this man, you have to laugh. You have to. You got a personality because he has been in this business and, and comedy and done so many things over the years. Question: um, My here's my favorite question. What made you get into acting? You know, I think it was this. <laughs> <laughs> 
What was that? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I think that uh, we we are all uh, influenced by those um, elements that assault our senses as we as we grow up. Uh, I, I wanted to be a doctor too. You know, I was fascinated with what what made made things tick. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and but I also had a flair. I think you know, seeking the attention. You know, um, I was an only child raised by uh, six women: uh, my, my my mom, my three aunts, my grandmother, and then after me, my my first cousin Roxanne was the sixth woman in my life. So they were always very supportive of me. And there was always music playing, uh, 78 records, which I have today of like real record albums when they came in albums and there was one song for 78 and listening to show music, um, watching the Three Stooges and cartoons and Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy and all those things that, that touched my funny bone. And so I always was kind of seeking to be the center of attention. And my mother, may she rest in peace, very supportive of me. Uh, not the stage mother, fortunately. I, I didn't care for the way mothers treated their uh, children of my age. And uh, it embarrassed me. So mom knew under no uncertain terms must she do that with me. And she respected that. But she got me involved. She saw the, the potential. My Aunt Rose, may she too rest in peace. They saw the potential and got me involved in a dance class. And at the end of each year, they do a review. And me and this little girl, Maxine Gilman, were always the center there. And they build the shows around us. And that was the beginning of the community theater, the Lancaster Little Theater. And then eventually a, a, a production of Dark at the Top of the Stairs at what is now the Fulton Theater, it was called the Fulton Opera House, that where we met a gentleman named Chuck Miller, who was a play, an aspiring playwright from New York who was wanting to pay his rent. So he was jobbed in to run the lights for this production, took a liking to my mother and me, this is 1959, and told my mom, one year I'm going to get your son on Broadway. And within two years, he got me there because he had uh, um, uh, connections with the producer uh, of, the, of the, the play, and they were looking for a replacement to uh, uh, Johnny Borden, who's playing Randolph McAfee, and they were, <laughs> excuse me, looking for the replacement. And um, I came in and auditioned, and the rest, as they say, is history. That launched the career. One word, 1978. <laughs> the film came out, you were in it. It was called Grease. Well, 77 is when we uh, started principal photography, but yes, it hit the silver screen in 78, as you say. And I mean, that's a wide open, uh, that's a wide open subject, Ronald. What would you like to ask me about? <laughs> well, before we ask that, we got a, we got a present for you. you Roll it, Tony. <laughs> Attention seniors. Hey, so uh, what'd you do with your summer day? What did you do with your summer day? Oh, I spent most of it at the beach. Oh, I just love the first day of school, don't you? Oh, come on. You don't want to hear all the morning details. Are you okay? Are you okay? Sandy. Wow, we grew up with Greece. Woo! We grew up with it. My goodness. Got a few photos. I want to show them to you one by one so you get an idea of it, bring you back in time. Here's one. Yeah. Who's Boy, that I, handsome young man? Who was that guy? I sometimes ask myself the same thing. I mean, <laughs> you know, this 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 crumbling uh, vessel, <laughs> you know, and then you look at something like that and you see it pre-crumble. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have bad looking at that at that point, come to yep. think of it. Yeah. That's it. That was your that was the moment that we see Sandy uh, uh, ch ha ha having changed, having, having um, uh, morphed into what they call bad Sandy. That was that, yes. I, love, I love that moment in the film too. In fact, I love that entire sequence where we initially see John now has donned the jacket, the, the uh, uh, jocks uh, sweater, the, uh, and, and we think he's kidding around. And the moment that we realize that he's not, that particular, and I've said this before in other interviews, that particular reaction that I give in that, in that moment where I transitioned from not believing to believing uh, was one of the more honest moments I think that I've ever had on screen or, or, or on theater maybe even. And then when we see, moments later we see her and Kelly who plays Putsy taps, he's seen her first. He taps me, I look and I tap Michael Tucci who plays Sonny and we, but we all turn, it's a really cool moment. 
here's another here's another picture you and the cast members yeah my 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 uh, uh t-bird compadres so you got john in the center michael tucci in the back behind me off onto our camera left and then me of course kelly ward who's below in the foreground and my dear late friend jeff conaway who in my life because we grew up together in manhattan was zuko in fact he played zuko in the first national tour right. stage play which I joined in 70, uh, 73, and he was playing Zuko at the time and was an unbelievable Zuko. He'd done it in New York too. He'd understudied Barry Bostwick, but then he also, uh, he was on the road. But then when, when they came to LA, Barry came out to do it in LA and, and Jeff went back to New York to do it. And uh, he was the definitive Zuko with all due respect to John Travolta, who was brilliant as Zuko in the film. And, and uh, uh, Jeff as Kinnicky, if you recall. But yeah, that's that's that was our thing. Our maybe our our first or second day of shooting summer nights. Wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are days. Yeah, they were great days. As you think back to the young lady that you worked with, and that's that's now gone, now left us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Olivia. She mm -hmm. was um, she was a, a force, a gentle giant. Uh, often you refer to a gentle giant as being someone of a large physical stature her presence was large yeah. and her heart larger uh and at the same time uh in 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 uh, uh opposition but not an, not opposing but working with yes. that it was a spirit of love and light that is un was unparalleled uh, you know was is still she her mark is continues to be left and, you know, they just had the walk for wellness the other day Yes. Uh, in Melbourne and, and all over, you know, anybody that did the Komen walk, for instance, which my my wife is a champion of and has done mm -hmm. um, for for to, to fight cancer and breast cancer, breast cancer in particular. So this um, th this this woman has um, has left an in incredible legacy and she was just as incredible a human being and great, to, great fun to work humble, humble. To leave a, you know, because she had she had done one other film before called Tomorrow that didn't go very well. So she was a little skittish about wanting to, even wanting to do this. And you, you, you've read these things. People have read these things of this particular story where she insisted on a, a, a screen test herself, wanted to have a, you know, she, would, she wasn't going to do it unless she felt that she could. And others, the creatives felt that she could. It wasn't enough for just the creatives. So she did it. And John helped her through that process, that screen test. He was just delightful with her and uh, she convinced herself. And then again, the rest they say is history. You came here today, among other things, to talk about a new play that you're working in called Lend Me a Tuna. <laughs> well, tenor, tenor. well, no, if, if, I, if, I, if my guitar wasn't sounding right, you'd have to lend me the tuner, but I've got a couple of them, an electric one actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let me a tenor. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, we're doing this at the International City Theater, and it's a it's a role. Um, uh, I play the role of Henry Saunders, who's the the, the uh, uh, head of the um, uh, uh, Cleveland uh, Grand Opera Company, and and the the particular play takes place at uh, pre pre the function, uh, which is the the tenth anniversary of the Cleveland Grand Opera Company, and um, uh, I'm the manager of the company, and and uh, our uh, tenor for that for the evening, Tito Morelli, the greatest tenor of our generation, uh, is supposed to be singing, and he's late. And then not only is he late, but other things, other crazy co co comedic things ensue that I won't give away. But it's a role that I'd played before when my hair had to be grayed up. You know? So now I'm the right age to play it, and it's a fabulous farce by Ken Ludwig, um, uh, and uh, it's it's one of if I had never played it before, it that would have been one on my bucket list. And I've had the, the honor now to do it twice before and now doing it again under the direction of the fabulous Todd Nielsen, our director uh, down at ICT. And I'd always wanted to work at ICT, but um, just uh, things got in the way and never could. And, and now uh, my, uh, my debut, if you will, in that particular theater, though I have played the Terrace in 1994, that huge, gorgeous theater, when it was the Long Beach Civic Light Opera, I'd done Can Can down there. It was a great experience. So now I get to work in this little sister theater. It's a, just a gem of a, uh, of a theater and a gem of a company uh, run by Karen Desai. They've been around forever. 
So right. now I, I had the opportunity and it's a crazy, wonderful farce. Uh, Nick Tubbs, who uh, plays Max, uh, we've worked together on several occasions. I've actually uh, directed him in a production of Grease for what was then the Cabrillo Music Theater, now Five Star. He played mm -hmm. Duty actually in that production. This is great about this, this business, how our paths you know, continue to cross. So Michael Scott Harris, who I'd done ragtime with just before the pandemic hit down at Musical Theater West, he plays Tito Morelli. Bella Hicks, who I'd never worked with before, plays Maggie. Um, who else? Uh, uh, Matt Curtin plays the bellhop. He's actually played Max before, and he is spectacular. So funny. So, so funny. Terrific. Holly Jean, who plays Julia, uh, is also terrific. She's she's the the um, the chair the chairwoman of the uh, of the Cleveland Grand Opera Company. Um, and uh, Jade Santana plays Maria, who's Tito's crazy Italian wife. And Kaylin Leilani, who plays Diana, is just also very stunning. And, you know, our staff, Donna Parsons, who is our production stage manager, we've worked together before. And, and um, uh, Maggie of, of uh, Frankhauser, who's the assistant uh, um, stage manager, we've never worked before. But that's that's a developing wonderful relationship too. It's a terrific collaborative art, Ron, as I'm sure well you know. And, and this is a perfect example of that collaboration, which is about to bring to fruition a wonderful, wonderful evening of entertainment for, for your viewers. What are the dates of the run? So we go, um, our previews are October 19 and 20. We open the 21st and we play uh -huh. Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays uh, until November the 6th. And one can get tickets at the internationalcitytheater.org or you can actually call the box office 562-436-4610 and come out and, and see us and, and uh, laugh and go crazy with us. You'll, you'll really enjoy it. Again, proof of vaccination required and all that stuff. Proof yes, all that stuff indeed. In, yes, yes, yes. Um, Barry, we're out of time right now. But no, 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 let's do more. I don't like doing these things, you can tell. I understand, me. understand, understand, <laughs> understand. Please Thank come you. back again at another time. I've really enjoyed this interview. I am just a mouse click or a phone call away, my friend. Barry, right. thank you very much for taking us on the journey of a renowned film called Greece. And thank you for doing what you've given to the over the years to the public. And back please at you, my thank friend. Our beloved publicist. You. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And please thank our beloved publicist, Lucy Pollack. Yes. yes. Indeed. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, Barry Pearl. Thank you, sir. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. We want to get, we just got some good news, ladies and gentlemen, that we want to share with you. On Thursday, September the 1st, the United Broadcasting Network, or UBNGO, Roku Channel, was launched. We're all very excited. We have a great lineup of UBNGO content to program, including this program, the Actors' Choice, as we call it, TAC. So to get information, please go to programming at ubngo.com. That's programming at ubngo. We want to thank you very much. Okay? Roll it, Tony. I think I trust them the least of all. Been with you all these years, Malcolm. Doesn't that mean anything? Only you know if I can trust you. And if I can, <laughs> what are you asking for? Will you at least tell me why you are meeting with him? I mean, I deserve to know that. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is an internationally acclaimed, award winning playwright and screenwriter for film and television. Whew. His produced stage, stage, stage plays included Keep the Faith, a musical about the life and times of my former congressman, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Others include Fathers and Other Strangers, Fraternity, The Apology, and you just saw a piece of it, The Meeting, which has been produced in all 50 states and more than a dozen countries, including South Africa, the Netherlands, Canada, Nigeria, and other countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Jeff Stetson. Jeff, welcome. Right, to good to see you. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. By the way, what a resume you got. I said that and read all that stuff that you've done. My goodness. And I do want to tell folks, yes, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was my congressman when I lived in Harlem years ago. He was the man. He was the he, man. He okay. was an extraordinary leader. Yes. He really was. Where were you born from? Harlem. That's what I thought. Birds of a feather flocking together. Man, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. What part of Harlem did you live in? Sugar Hill, 147th Street. Come on with it. And convent, yeah. <laughs> Come on with it. Ain't no place like Harlem. <laughs> Love that place, my goodness. Uh, we got a bunch of photos about you. You are a busy man. Tony, would you please do the liberty of putting up the first? Who is that handsome young man? <laughs> Who the bees? High school. <laughs> I do this my research, and when I found that, I said, yeah. "Let's get, let's get, let's get busy with it." Let's yeah, you, you frightened me with all those photos you came up with. Okay, well, let's see the next one, please. <laughs> now there you are. All those books around you. I hear people say, you know, when you write, you know, when you read. It makes a better writer out of you. Have, is that true? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Whenever someone asks me how to, you know, how to become a better writer, I just say read and read things that you typically wouldn't read to expand the mind. I mean, just don't read just what you like. Read to get a sense of style and rhythm and the kinds of issues that are out there. Wow. And again, that's 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 the purpose of the whole idea. What some people might not know the difference between a screenwriter and uh, a, a playwright. Please tell them, please. A playwright writes for the stage. And as a playwright, you have complete control over your work. Uh, you know, it can't be changed unless you provide the permission to do that. As a screenwriter, you write for, you know, Hollywood or the big screen. Um, and it's possible that you write a script and then not recognize it uh, when it's produced because they could bring in several other writers to rewrite it, which is why I became a playwright because it was important to me to control the integrity of my work. And I wanted to establish, you know, a record of success so that when I made the transition into film and television, I'd at least be protected a bit more than if I came in as a new writer. But as a screenplay writer, you do get paid. <laughs> you get paid a lot. I guess that helps the pain. <laughs> Here's another picture we got of you. Jeff, ah, I heard that you were the teacher at the original Bill Cosby class at USC School of Cinema. Yeah, the, the first year we did that. Yes. There's yeah. a guy in there you and I know, Michael Jockway. Yeah, it's a good group. Yeah. Back in the days, boy, my man. Uh, then we got another photo that I found. I found this one, searching around. Ha <laughs> ha, there's a play fraternity. Fraternity. That was <clears throat> that was an extraordinary uh, play in terms of the response at Ebony Showcase. They brought it back three times. It had an incredible cast. Yes. Um, yeah, I was really proud of that uh, that production. There's some famous people in that picture. Yeah, they're all famous. Hey, thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, and they're all extremely talented. So I, I was really privileged to have them uh, spend as much time as they did on the, on the work. There's Bill Jones over there. We miss him. We do miss him, indeed. Yeah, unfortunately, two of the actors that were in the play uh, are no longer with us. Yes. You know, and I saw you had uh, something about the, the the meeting when it was on American Playhouse with Dick Anthony Williams and Jason Bernard. Both of those men are no longer with us. It's a real loss. In spirit, they'll always be with us. They left, yeah, left a lot yeah. behind. Definitely. Good, good friends. I miss them a lot. Yes. Here's another picture of you and another handsome young man. You know this guy very well. Ah, August Wilson. Yeah, we were in uh, Connecticut. That This was uh, the Playwrights Conference at the O'Neill, where Lloyd Richards uh, provides the guidance. That was a special five weeks, but I don't think I'd ever want to repeat it. That's a long time to be away from home in a place that's 110 degrees. So. <laughs> you were in fact... Uh, yeah, that brought me to the to the attention of Hollywood because all the agents come out to see who the new writers are, and that's mm -hmm. how I made the transition into film and television. You hear that, ladies and gentlemen? For those of you that want to get into the business, listen to what this man is talking about. He's been there, done it. A lot of things that you have to know about this business. There's many things, indeed. Indeed. You wrote a couple of books. One of them was Blood on the Leaves. Yeah, that was actually the, my my only novel, first novel written in 2004. And we set it up at Paramount um, for Jamie Foxx after he just won the Oscar. But I knew they weren't gonna do it. I mean, you know, it was far too controversial for the studios at that time. Later on, we had Morgan Freeman want to do it as a television series. And again, we had no success. 
So we're at it. Uh, I'm not going to give it up because it's it's too good a project, <clears throat> and there are too many people who want to see it done. So uh, we're still at it. Where do you get ideas for your plays at? Life. Come on. Life. Just listen. And you know, when you read a lot, um, those stories stay with you. I mean, Fraternity was a play that impacted me when I was 12 years old and you know, heard about the bombing in Birmingham that killed four young girls. And uh, 35 years later, I wrote, wrote a play inspired by that. Um, obviously being around Adam Clayton Powell and recognizing what he went through, uh, I always felt I wanted to do something on Adam and it, and it turned out the best way to do that was a musical because it's, you know, he, I covered 45 years of his life. And of course, the, the wives that he had Yes. We're all theatrical. I mean, Hazel Scott was an extraordinary pianist and actress. You know, he was married to the Cotton Club, you know, women for a while. So uh, he was just a fascinating character. Yes, he was. Yes. Yeah, but you, from your own life, I mean, what are the experiences that, you know, that touch you? What what have you read that stays with you that you think uh, can be explored in a different way? Uh, Blood on the Lees was also... Uh, in some ways related to that bombing, uh, because I wanted to deal with the story of what happens uh, to black men when they get in positions of power, do they become just like the people they uh, wanted to replace? And I wanted to deal with the fact that young people in college really <clears throat> didn't know much about the civil rights movement. And in the South, I wanted to make sure that they knew there were people who got away with murder who was still living quite well in the South and that they shouldn't be uh, supported. Um, and as, as it turned out, it, it became a vigilante uh, story because you have somebody killing all of these folks who got away with murder in the same way that they committed the murder against the civil rights movement. So it's very provocative, but it raises questions of who's a hero and who's a terrorist. And because we, you know, we love the John Wayne myth but when John Wayne is black, it's a, it's a problem. So, you know, I wanted to raise those issues and I was so happy to see the, the kind of response we got. You know, I used to travel the country to meet with book clubs that had read the book. And, you know, as you may or may not know, uh, there's a lot of black book clubs, but 98% of the participants are women. And this was finally a book that got the brothers involved, you know, that the brothers would come and say, yeah, I want to read that. Not, you know, not just sports stories or, you know, boxing heroes, but, you know, stuff, stuff that was uh, pertinent to our lives because we forget history uh, and therefore we repeat it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for saying that. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Here's another picture of you and a gentleman who we left. We lost him. Sidney Poitier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I met, well, I met him on, on that day. I became an educator because of Sidney Poitier and his performance in The Sir With Love. You know, I saw that movie and I said, hey, what a great occupation, you know, to, <clears throat> to have students sing to you at the end of each semester and have an impact in their lives. And then when I met him, I told him the story that I became an educator because of him. And then I realized that what I really should have done is become a writer that would inspire people to tell their own kind of stories. But he, he was always, Sidney Portier and, and Denzel Washington were always people long before I became a writer that I saw as role, uh, role models, you know, powerful black men um, who had integrity. And the first few plays I wrote, every play I wrote, either starred Sidney Poitier in my imagination or Denzel Washington, because I wanted those heroic kind of figures. So yeah, he he's just an amazing man. And I had the privilege of meeting all, so many of the people who inspired me from Sidney Poitier to, you know, um, Harry Belafonte to, you know, Bill Cosby before Bill Cosby became Bill Cosby. <laughs> um, and so many other folks. So the profession has allowed me the opportunity to get to know these people and, and work with them. Here's another well-known person, Dr. John Kenney. Can I? Yeah, um, he directed the meeting in South Africa 25, 30 years ago, and they brought it back. And uh, I went to South Africa for the new 
<clears throat> production about two years ago. And John and I spent probably out of the week that I was there, we spent probably four or five days together. The day I left, he gave me a private tour of the uh, apartheid museum, which he was instrumental in establishing. And we spent about two to three hours walking through that incredible museum. And every time I walked through an exhibit, I thought I was here in the country seeing the civil rights movement because there were so many similarities. You see photos of the dogs sicked on uh, these young African-American uh, and Africans, uh, you know, children. And you saw the lynchings and you saw the brutality. And it was a, a, quite an emotional experience. But Connie was um, such an important political figure in South Africa, as well as an artist. And he told me many of these stories that, you know, they. You know, they, they tried to kill him because he was in a play where a white woman, the white actress kissed him on the cheek and that was enough for him to be almost killed. He was stabbed, he was dying and the, uh, the doctors had to put him in a virus contaminated area so the police wouldn't go in and find him. Uh, just, just an extraordinary uh, country. People as poor as they are, uh, always greet you with a smile, always see you as part of them uh, as a Black American. So it, uh, and they gave me a, a, a name before I left in South Africa that, that meant the voice of our people, which, uh, you know, was pretty special. Speaking of South Africa, here's a picture of you near the doorway of Nelson Mandela's home. Yeah, there are still bullet wounds of bullet markings in the walls where the police came and shot into the house. Um, it's a very small house. I mean, it's, it's, it's about a room the size of most rooms where you live, but it was extraordinary to be there um, and to see the continuing impact that he's had on that nation and really the world. Okay. You were there, you gave a presentation to some South African students, understand? I did. That was, there they are. Yeah, that, that was a very special. In fact, I stay in touch or they stay in touch with me. There's at least three or four of the students who have become writers and they send me their work and I give them notes um, and I encourage them. Uh, that, that was really special. I mean, I also <clears throat> spent time with professional writers and actors, but, but <clears throat> being at that school where you're dealing with young people, um, who come alive yes. when you really give them something that moves them and inspires them. That, you know, that comes really from my own educational background, wanting to be an educator and, and uh, helping students discover their own talents and also an understanding of our history. Okay. We've got a couple more to show you. Here's one. Uh, this is the one that people see. This is a famous photo that people see, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Famous picture. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they, they were there for a minute and a half. That's all it took. <clears throat> and it's an iconic photo of what could have happened had they, as the, in, the, in the play in the meeting, I write, um, just imagine what could have happened if we joined hands and pushed in the same direction. Yes. Speaking of recently, this is the last one we're going to show you. This, uh, I understand that the Actors Theater back in September had a, a meeting. They, they, they had a Show of you, one of your plays called The Meeting. Yeah, I, I wasn't at that production, but I remember them sending me the copy of the, the poster and you know telling me about how, how much they appreciated the work. What's next for you, Jeff? Well, I'm doing the uh, MLK slash X. Uh, limited series for Disney Plus. I wrote the pilot. In fact, we go into production next week in Atlanta. It was supposed to be a 10 episode series ending on my play, <clears throat> but because of budget reasons, they now cut two episodes. So that's not making me too happy or encouraged. But it's a it's a wonderful project with a terrific cast. And I hope, uh, you know, it, it brings special attention to, to the way these two men ought to be viewed. Because often if you, believe or accept or embrace Martin Luther King, you can't do that to Malcolm. And if you, Malcolm is your, you know, man, then you don't like King. 
And the play was always written because I wanted to indicate that these two men were part of the same continuum in civil rights and human rights. They died for the same reasons and they should be embraced uh, by everyone. And so the series was created as a result of uh, having seen the play many years ago, Reggie Bythewood and Gina Prince Bythewood, uh, our executive producing it along with myself and others. So it's a, it's a special project. So I hope it works out, but I am concerned that it's already being cut. Definitely want to thank you so much for being a guest today. I know we've learned uh, something about being a playwright and a screenwriter. Uh, all I can say is please keep on doing what you're doing. Best wishes. Thank you, Ron. And I appreciate bringing all those memories back. Indeed. When I found out that you were born and raised in Harlem, I said, I got to talk to that man. <laughs> Sugar, to that Sugar man. Hill. Sugar yeah. Hill. I lived in, at St. Nicholas Project, 130th right. Street. Yes, indeed. Yeah. indeed. Now, there's no city like it anywhere in the world. Whenever I go to New York, as soon as I get off the plane, I start singing. Right. Indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Stetson. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Raman, Photography as an Art. Ron Irwin's Lose a Life, a way to wait, lose some weight. Mary, Larry Buford's book to the future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule. State Farm agent Carla Green and veteran actor Rob Brownstein's Actor Training School and Actor Space. Much thanks to giving our guest today, television, film, and theater actress Ritella Damas, actor, director, teacher Barry Pearl, and award-winning playwright and screenwriter Jeff Stetson. And of course, special thanks to all of our ever-growing audience. We say be well. We'll see you next time.